Hello, everybody. I'm Annie Tindley, and I'm a member and a trustee of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. And it's my absolute honour and privilege uh, to be providing this short introduction to our 1829 talks. As you'll know, the 1829 talks have a long history um, and really reflect some of the, the key driving forces behind NHSN. Um, our passion for the natural world, for natural history, and for education as well. So these talks really are a platform um, for our, our budding naturalists of all stages to share their enthusiasms, to share their expertise about the natural world and the work that they're doing, um, and to really kind of push that across the whole of the Northeast as a region, um, so anyone can get involved. Of course, we're all on the virtual world at the moment, and um, hopefully we'll be seeing each other in person before too long. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy this talk, uh, virtual though it is, um, and have a good evening. Hi everyone, I'm Ryan, an ecologist currently based in the northeast of England. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a course that I'm running next month for NHSN, entitled Beginning with Bryophytes. Mosses, liverworts and hornworts are collectively known as bryophytes. They are often described as lower plants, but are just as evolved as, and as complex as flowering plants. They evolved over 500 million years ago and were the first land plants to evolve. There are around 20,000 species worldwide and around 1,100 of these can be found in Britain, which is over half of Europe's bryophytes, meaning that Britain is a really important area for bryophytes. They reproduce in spores which means that they don't have any flowers or seeds and their life cycle is really complicated and fascinating and we'll get, dive into this in more detail on the course. Bryophytes are amazing for a variety of reasons. They don't have vascularized structures like flowering plants, which means that they don't have these tubes carrying water and sugars to different parts of the plant. This means that they're reliant on water to diffuse throughout their cells. This means they often need wet places in which to live. When it's not wet, such as in the spring and summer months, they can stop their metabolism and just curl up and wait for the wetter weather to um, come. And when they can unfurl and flourish in the winter and autumn months. Throughout this presentation and throughout the course, I hope you see that bryophytes are really colourful and diverse and they aren't just these green smudges that you find in lawns and on your roof. Bryophytes are really important keystone species. They are a key, the key component for forming peat bogs. They colonise early successional habitats and allowing other species to colonise as well. And themselves, they also support other species, including specialist invertebrates and fungi. There are many reasons to study bryophytes. Firstly, they have a lot of species, and these species are great microhabitat indicators. They tell you a lot about the habitat they are in at a detailed level. They're at the best in autumn and winter. This is when other species, such as invertebrates, and flowering plants aren't at their best so it's a really good group then to look out for them and also when the leaves aren't on the trees it's easier to spot bryophytes. As I mentioned a second ago they're really important in their own right and they're really beautiful amazing things but they're also keystone species supporting lots of other species. You can find them wherever you are and um, there'll be bryophytes all around you and there's also lots still to learn about even the commonest of species. They are a really understudied group and you can make fascinating discoveries. The Northeast supports some really special species and habitats. And another great thing is that although there's a huge diversity of species, many of the common and large species are easy to identify in the field and these are the ones we would focus on in the course. You can find bry bryophytes wherever you are. They occur on a large variety of habitats and substrates and many bryophytes are substrate specific so you only find them on growing, growing on living trees etc. They can be found in every habitat from the mountain tops 
right down to the seashore. The only place where you don't find bryophytes is in the sea itself. Woodlands are a really great place to start looking for bryophytes. You can find them on the woodland floor, you can grow, find them growing up trees, on dead wood, on rocks and in streams. Woodlands are a really good place and due to the humidity the bryophytes found there are often larger than in other areas which means they're easier to spot and get to grips with. During the course we will have two one and a half hour zoom sessions. These will take place on Monday the 15th and the 22nd of March at 7pm. No prior knowledge is needed for this course, just enthusiasm to want to learn more. There'll be lots of opportunities to ask questions and we'll be covering three key areas. Firstly, we'll look at bryophyte biology and ecology. We'll look at the importance of the northeast for bryophytes and we'll also look at some key species that you can get to grips with in your local area. So in terms of bryophyte biology and ecology, we'll look at the main groups of mosses and liverworts and how to separate them. We'll look in more detail at the importance of mosses and liverworts in terms of um, the key part that they play in habitats. We'll look at their complicated and fascinating lifestyle, which is really unique. And we'll also look at the threats that face bryophytes from habitat loss to succession, and also the emerging threat of climate change, which will affect many of our bryophytes. We'll look at 15 to 20 common and widespread species. And here we'll look at the ID features that you need to be able to identify them, the habitats that they're found in. And this will enable you to go out and practice and look for these species around you. All of these species can be found in urban and woodland areas, and which means you don't have to go far look, to look for them. I'm also going to how you can take it from there, the sorts of equipment that you might need, the best books to have a look at, and also the websites out there that can help you identify bryophytes. And you may not think that there's a lot of bryophytes in your local area, but next time you go out for a local walk, have a look. There'll be bryophytes going on the trees, within the grass and on walls and gravestones and cemeteries and places like that. And also on the pavement itself, there'll be bryophytes. On the course, we're also going to detail about some of the special places in the northeast that have really important bryophyte, bryophyte floras and the key habitats that some of these species are found in. And I'm going to go into a bit of detail on this now. So the Northeast has over 650 bryophytes, making it a really important area for them. Bryophyte diversity in Britain increases as you go further north and west. So being at the northern tip of England, this means that we have a lot of bryophytes here. And the further west you go in our area, the more bryophytes you encounter. Rocky crags, especially in the uplands, can be really important for bryophytes in our area. If you have a look at this picture here and think about all the microhabitats that there might be for mosses and liverworts to thrive in. So firstly, if you think about the trees themselves, these will support different species depending on whether they're acidic like this birch tree shown here or whether they have a more basic bark. The ground can support carpets of bryophytes, especially in, in wetter areas. Even areas of open water, including streams and ponds, can have um, mosses and liverworts living right underneath the water and growing there. Heathland can have its own bryophytes as well in these acidic conditions especially under areas of heather, which can create microclimatic, microclimatic conditions which can suit some bryophytes. And then we also have the rock faces themselves. These are a real special feature of these rocky crags. And the north facing rock faces and the south facing rock faces can have completely different bryophytes growing there. The north facing rock faces are the most diverse. 
these tend to be cooler and wetter, meaning that liverworts can thrive here. And you can find a really diverse array of liverworts on these rock faces. Sphagnum bogs are really important as well. And the northeast is really important for sphagnum bogs. And this is why there's a lot of work to restore them. Sphagnum bogs really are amazing places. The sphagnum itself is a type of moss and it stores up to 20 times its own weight in water, soaking it up and locking it away. It also locks away a vast amount of carbon, but this carbon also leaks out when these bogs are damaged. And the way that these bogs are often damaged is through cutting the peat. So when the sphagnum is growing, it grows from the top and at the bottom it starts to break down forming peat. And this peat is dug up to, um, to be used in the horticultural industry, damaging these bogs and releasing vast amounts of carbon. Sphagnum bogs are a really key way to be able to help tackle climate change. Sphagnum bogs also support a vast array of other species. They support lots of flowering plants, other bryophytes grow within the sphagnum, and they also have specialist invertebrates and fungi there. We also look at places such as Teesdale and the specialist bryophytes found there. So if you look here at the different microhabitats that could be found in, in this photo. So we've got rock faces, some of these will be wet rock faces with water running down them that will support their own specialist species. We could have areas of bog habitat, areas of fresh water, some of which might be acidic and some which might be basic. And these will support different species. Some of the water might be slow flowing or fast flowing and this supports different species. There'll be patches of heathland which will support even more species and especially if you have calcareous flushes running through some of these habitats, they support a different diversity of species there. So I hope I've given you a taste of the course and shown you that bryophytes are diverse, fascinating and really important. Also that the northeast is a really important area for bryophytes and a great place to study them. There are also a, com a number of common species though which are easily recognised in the field of practice. And this is what we'll be learning about on the course. Please do check out Eventbrite and the, the NHSM website to find out more information. And if you have any questions about the course, please do drop me an email or message me on Twitter. I hope to see lots of you there.